morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And I want to clarify, please do not be me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I've already started to regret being me, so <laughs> don't do that. All right, so, and uh, I try, uh, this is my excuse that if it's blew, like, blew up this, uh, in this uh, presentation because uh, it's, uh, I keep changing the context, keep reading the literatures, and eventually I even don't know where I end up. So, but the main purpose here is I, when I realize that we have a very heavy uh, psychological oriented uh, it, uh, sessions, I think it's uh, probably it's better to balance a little bit back to the biology part. And so that's why I want to prevent, uh, I want to present a little bit more on biological side of PTSD. And uh, not too much on the treatment part is because uh, we do, we, we have a limited um, medication treatment. So in this case, uh, if anything, after the scope, that, uh, that, or after the expectation, and we can discuss about that uh, later privately if, uh, if you want something to be different next time, or if there's next time there. <laughs> All right, okay. So first is I, uh, my conflict of interest is I received, uh, my research partially supported by the uh, Mitex, which is an industry and uh, government liaison uh, uh, foundation, and not necessarily directly from the industry, but industry definitely played the role. And uh, that mine is from Alora, and my student uh, Jacob is working on the canvas-related research with PTSD and in and uh, on animal models. So other than that, I do not have any other support. So my speech here is only present, uh, represent myself, not the Canadian Secretary Association. I think I made uh, some mistakes in the past, so I need to really speak out. <laughs> okay, all right. So, and uh, no, no conflict of interest with the materials. I delete all, everything that's potentially conflict of interest. So, and so, all right. So the main objective for today is I try to, rec to introduce how do we recognize PTSD. I guess that it could be mainly going through the, the DSM-5 and then we can see what's the risk factors because that really play a very important role for, patient, for patients who developed PTSD. And after that, I'm trying try to link the neurobiology with the symptoms, and uh, if possible, the, the, pharm the pharmacological treatment. And uh, then introduce the principle, say, if we are facing a P PTSD patient, a potentially PTSD patient in our practice, what kind of principles should we do and what we should not do? And then last is to quickly go through what the, the guidelines from all over the world and what do they say, what do they recommend, and, uh, but not going to spend too much time in each individual medications. All right, so what, what is PTSD? I guess that's we all heard, we all heard the terms quite often, and here we're all professionals, so we, we know way better than the general population. And just like a depression, it's really, overly used term. Whenever that's a, a, a person come to us to say, oh, you know, I got a PTSD, and probably just because some very tiny things happened. So I, I think it's really important to not assault the patient with PTSD using, overly use this term, because that's a tragedy happened to them, and it, it, we, we will hardly, we will, we will hardly to imagine Imagine it. So that's why do the education first. So first, PTSD is a mental illness. It involved exposure to the trauma that involved the death or threat of death, serious I injury or sexual violence. So not things that you have a fight with your boss, not the thing that you lost your 
some some I, I'm say like probably your your we, your wedding rings. That that's quite traumatic, but I I don't think it meets the traumatic criteria. So how do we remember? Oh, there's a distinctive symptoms that separate PTSD from other things that uh, the other mental health con conditions. So here, I think this uh, mnemonics is, uh, might be helpful for us to, to, to remember that. That's uh, as a medical student or as a resident, we really love this kind of like uh, terms all together. So called trauma. Trauma is like, first we have to have a traumatic events before the symptoms and the signs of PTSD develop. So second is the very, very distinctive one is re-experience. We, we going through again, again, the things, the signs, the dreams, and that's related to the trauma. And we try to avoid to be reminded about the trauma. So that's avoidance. We try to go away from the, the site or doing the things that, that the trauma happened. Like if you, have a, if you have a car accident, you probably will take, take a while for you to go back to the well. And unable to function, that's definitely one of the major things. If everything happened, and, but you're still going on, you're still able to do whatever you like, and that's, we hardly call them disorder. So then the symptoms has to last longer than one month. Why is that? It's because if it's within one month, we have another term called acute stress disorder. Acute stress disorder, and most of patients with acute stress disorder will eventually recover. So that's a slightly different, even from biological and the psychological perspective, and with PTSD. And the last one is arousal increased. We we can easily when we watch TV, you can see the hypervigilant and insomnia. Every Every part of that can be lumped something into this under under this category. Okay, so so why knowing PTSD is, is important? As one well said, there's a lot of misunderstanding around. And second is it can affect any any of us, and it regardless regardless of your age, your your ethnicities, or your your gender, your social status. It's not like. Alzheimer's mostly happened in the senior person. It could happen in any place. But uh, trauma, does, trauma and abuse does not mean that it uh, definitely will lead to PSD. We'll talk about that and because uh, the risk factors and resilience, resilience played very important role there. So, and also, trauma does not only lead to PTSD. And some people does not really develop PTSD, but but do suffer from but do suffer from depression, anxiety, and substance use disorder. So in that case, it's not like a one to one or the, like one we link. It's very complex. So it's at times it's often overlooked because especially that when I went through my psychiatry residency training and uh, we're quite familiar with uh, bipolar depression, anxiety, and sclerophenia. But PTSD, ADHD, this type, of, uh, this type of disorders kind of takes a second role and not necessarily always on, under our radar. When we ask questions, the question may not well reflect on the nature or really pick up the, pick up the sense. And the patient at times feel shamed to to talk about that, to bring to bring it up to you, and so in that case, we a lot of time we overlooked this situation, and in some very complex PTSD patient, and we may mis mis misdiagnose that with borderline personality or other personality disorders, and then that leading to a treatment delay or a. a, a a directions that may not leading them to, to, to recover or give them a right label for them to, to own the, the diagnosis. So then I also noticed that quite a lot of people are very uncomfortable talking talk about PTSD or talk about the trauma. And when, when we see the, the interviews and even student interviews that you can see, 
when the patient brought up their traumatic events, and a lot of times that's uh, our medical students shift their conversation quickly back to whatever they were originally uh, uh, asking for, like the symptoms of depression or other things, rather than, rather than engage with, with the patient to talk about it. Why is that? It's because the, the, the way the explanation is like, uh, I do not want upset the patient. Oh, I feel the, it might harm the patient. But actually, when the patient takes the encouragement, finally willing to talk to you, willing to open up to talk about the, the trauma part, it's the best moment to engage. And you cannot be, you cannot, uh, you have to be brief enough to engage and to face the patient's trauma, which patients suffered for such a long time, rather than, oh, I, so it sounds like we are considerate, we are empathetic, but uh, it's probably will, will really re-harm, re or re will really harm the patient's initiative, and then f and make the patient into the way, say, nobody wants to listen, nobody cares. So that is something I think, at least for, for us, drop your agenda and engage with the patient to say, okay, if you like to talk, I'm here. Let's talk about it, rather than shine away. So then the comorbidity part is also very important, is because if we treat PTSD, we have to think about the PTSD, 80% of them have another diagnosis of mental health conditions. So we have to manage all of them together as a holistic way. So, and last one is PTSD can be treated, and with psychological uh, therapies that uh, Dr. Morrison and uh, Dr. Fairman will talk about, and also with psychiatrists limited help with medication. I think it it will the outcome is really really good. Okay, so as. Dr. Lau said, that it's very odd when I saw the data that Canada ranked the number one in the world in terms of PTSD rate. And if you see, I don't, I don't know if you can read the fine print down there. So Canada, the Netherlands, Australia, United States, New Zealand. So think about all the countries, and we probably make a picture of harmony and advanced and uh, freedom, everything's there. But uh, surprisingly, that we have highest PTSD in that countries. But if you look at the, down, the lowest part, Nigeria, China, Romania, Israel, Mexico. So you can hardly think about like Mexico. And when we go to Mexico, we're always worried about violence, but uh, why the PTSD symptoms or PTSD is lower there. So that, the paradox, nobody knows, but uh, I guess my, my very preliminary thought was, you know, when you live in a country has very nice life, things are going smoothly, and uh, if anything threw off your bus, it's gonna be really traumatic. If you live in, the, in, a, in a world that's day to day that you're living in the uncertainty and you get to, you have to deal with it and get used to this uncertainty. And since it's, the privilege is not coming naturally. And then I think the expectation would be different. And that's just my thought. And uh, also another part is living in the world, you need to fight, you need to survive and make you not or feel shamed to talk about that you're, not, you're vulnerable, you, you're injured by the events that everybody is going through. So that's, I think the two parties, it's underreported or it's become part of the genetic or epigenetic change that will make you say, it's not a big deal, let me move on. So that's my, my thought, I don't know. So, and second one is very interesting to see how different that the different populations are affected. Even that everybody has a chance to get PTSD, but in certain populations are extremely vulnerable. So we can see that in, in Canada we have 
9.2%, which is every one, every, every 10 person, there's about one in, in that population, in, in this, so it's pretty high. But our military have relatively low, even compared to our, our general population. And then the police part is extremely uh, diverse. So it really depends on what's the, what's a, what's, what's a job, what's a job like a scenario and, uh, and the years of the job that they are on. And the correctional, correctional officers definitely. And, but it, we, when we see this and we probably hardly think about as the highest one is the paramedics. Because paramedics is, we think that it's, it's a saving life and it's, a, it's not as dangerous as the police or it's not, not as dangerous as the firefighter or the military, but why is it have such a high one? So that will come back a little bit to see. When you, when you read the P, uh, DSM-5 and the criteria, one of them actually really captures well. It's called the re, repeat, repeated experience, repeated trauma. So that, I think that a firefighter may not be the everyday thing, but paramedic is the everyday thing. Every day, and also firefighter and the military, and sometimes we're dealing with things that are out of our control, disaster or, or, or being in the war zone, which is really insignificant from a, pers from a small, uh, from individual perspective. But if from par paramedics, why they, see, why they got to the paramedics, just like uh, all of us here, we want to help, we want to, we want to devote to, to improve people's life. But when you see all the trauma, when you see a lot of people who you cannot rescue, I think it really take personal. So that's another hypothesis I'm trying to put in there, because later on you will see here, and uh, different type of trauma actually causing a very different outcome for PTSD. So the first line of the first paragraph, or the first picture showed that uh, what's the proportions of people who develop PTSD and what kind of, what kind of uh, trauma they, they went through. The most of them either the accent or the witness of any accent or, or trauma. And uh, the relative low part is the, the rape and the molest. I think this is reflected on the, on the opportunities or the, or the chance these things happen. But if you see the next one, it's called probability of PTSD. And we can see it's almost flipped outside, flipped and to the opposite. Why is that? Is the witness the witness part is because it happened way more often than being raped. So that's why it takes the larger proportion of people, people who develop PTSD. But in terms of every person who witnessed trauma, and a very small percent, percentage of them will eventually develop PTSD. That means the impact of the witness or even the, or the accident are not as strong as the combat and the rape. So again, the sexual violence is one of the most profounding and impactful uh, violence to people. Again, that's also related to when, when, when we're going through a disaster like earthquake, flood, or fire, and we hardly blame on ourselves see things happened because of this. So we, so in that case, the moving on part and the to recover part will, much, will be much easier than the one that uh, we, uh, we were going through the, the, the sexual violence. No matter how much we're trying to, to, know, to help the victim to understand, it's not their fault. But deep inside, there's a lot of self-doubt and a lot of, a lot of, perspective change in terms of the world and the other people. And the world become very, very different and become very dangerous. And from the, from, it depends on you trust the world or you feel this is the whole world uh, turning against you and makes it so unsafe. 
So that's that's part of the the reason why it's become very personal, and then it's become very very uh, influential. So so as we say that. PTSD does not happen to every person that when they went through trauma. It's around 10 to 20 percent. It depends on what population we, we, we look. And majority of us, at least 60 to 80 percent of us, will experience trauma in our life, at least for once. But only 9 percent of them will have PTSD. So that, reflect, re, that reflected on this on the, the, pink, the, the pink one called no symptoms. But when, people, when, when patients who develop PTSD, it also show a very interesting and a very dynamic change. The PTSD symptoms can resolve in one month. That reflect, reflect a majority of a person who have uh, acute stress disorder, and some of them will gradually decrease, and some will remain with, with the symptoms continually going and uh, suffering from the, the symptoms. And some of them even did not really re develop anything until later on, and that's what we call late onset. So why it's so dynamic, it really comes from the personal the biological part and also the environment. We'll talk about a bit later about the vulnerability and also the resilience. So, this one is also very, this research shows a very interesting part is if you can see the intentional and non intentional harm. Let's say if we put them simpler, is if this is a disaster that's out of your control or car accident or earthquake, we call them non intentional but it's the personal violence, we call them intentional. So the, inten the, the non-intentional one may lead into a more tra traumatic symptoms at the beginning, but they can quickly recover, or they have a much higher recovery rate compared to the intentional one. The intentional one even go up with time. So that's, that's something that's really reflected on the nature of the trauma. So, as we mentioned about vulnerability, so this is a, a really big umbrella review. What is umbrella review? Umbrella review is uh, put all the meta-analysis reviews together and then to dissect them again. So that's kind of like a review of a review. So this one includes over 20,000 uh, patients who went through all the research. So they classified them into different uh, uh, factors that, uh, that this will also help us to understand what's going on and when we do the interview we can, we can think about more specifically um, into these categories and to figure out if the patient in front of us have some risk factors. So first is social demographic factor and in this paper it's a multinational paper, so it's very interesting they put the indigenous people of America as a class one. So that's really reflect on the reality and also the sadness that's for Canada as well. Of course, Australia and other countries that's a, who has the conflict, has a history of and with indigenous people suffer the similar situation. And that's part of the way you probably heard about called uh, generation trauma. And so the second one is female. Of course, that's, we all see that, we all know that. And then the social economic status is a low side, in term, is a low social, is a social demographic um, factors, but it's not as strong as the rest of them. So some other things like the personal, uh, the personal characters of the, of the victim of the PTSD patient may show some pre-trauma factors. So you can see here, the number one they, they figured out is physical dis uh, disease. It's not mental health, it's a physical disease. So, and second one is the family history of uh, psychiatry disorders. 
So that shows how, gen how genetic component plays a role. And then the psychiatry, the patient's personal psychiatry history, childhood trauma, it's a, an adverse during the childhood, that's a, that's a different uh, uh, severity. Or they list, list them to this way is because they probably have a different definition that in different research. So, and previous traumatic experience. So when we talk about around the time that the trauma happened, and we can see the accumul accumulative exposure of the potential trauma experiences, as we mentioned about the paramedics. So every time you have it and then you reinforce it by another trauma, even every single trauma does not cause not severe enough to cause the, the issue, but uh, all the cumulative part will definitely do the work. As we, if we punch our chair every day and it's not broken at one time, but eventually it's gonna be really fragile, then when you crash down it, you probably will, will get hurt. So, and then the severity of trauma, of course, that's a, we think about that is a mild one versus very extremely severe the life-threatening one versus the one that's uh, leading you to lost your financial status uh, will be different. Being trapped like in the, the way that's the hopeless, the, the vulnerability will really amplify it during the time. And torture. We can imagine that if we think about the way in the torture situations. And I think the humanity part or the belief of humanity will really be be shaked when we re going through this. So dissociate, dissociation during the trauma experiences and injury, and uh, that will linger longer and will remind us about the trauma when we have an injury that's uh, the pain every day, all the scars that leading to a very, to, 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 this is the, we're trying to avoid, or people trying to avoid this, is that's where avoidance go. But you cannot avoid your body to remind you every day, and that's definitely will cause more. So, and after the trauma, and one, we have a term I, would, I will introduce later, so it's called post-traumatic growth. That's a really, that's a bounce back. That's a bouncing back from the, in, from the injury, from the trauma, and then to reclaim our life, and then move on. So, if people developed acute stress disorder during the, the first months, and uh, it's indicated that the pe people might have, uh, people have higher rate to develop into a PTSD compared to people who never really developed any, any, any signs. So, and also the anxiety symptoms, the avoidance and the depression, they all contribute during the first, uh, right after the, the traumatic events, all contributed to the PTSD uh, occurrence. So I went through one car accident by myself and uh, I crossed uh, cr like a really major trans transactions and uh, the, the traffic light was broken in the early morning. So, and I was T-boned by a car with eight, I think 80 or 90 kilometers kilometers per hour speed. And when I realized where I am, and the car already from this side of the road and to the curb on another side. So, but uh, after that, I did not have any traumatic events after the, the so I guess that's, uh, that's one thing that tells how resilient I am. <laughs> so, but anyhow, I think that's, a, that's really, I just uh, think that's a, I, the symptoms I did not develop helped me to still be here and can talk about these this, uh, issues. So, okay, so when we talk about vi uh, vulnerability, and that's normally we will, we will think about, but one of the psychiatry theory that's really inspired me is called the positive psychology or the holistic, holistic psychology that developed by Rod, Rod, like Rod, 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 Carl Rogers. And that's all it tells. You never really see a person or the patient, just the patient in front of you. You see the patient is a person who are capable, but temporarily 
facing the issues. So trying to find the symptoms and trying to find the vulnerability and the risk factors is one part of our work. But also try to find the resilience, the strength, the power of the patient also plays an equal, equal important role. So what is res resilience? Resilience is the ability to maintain an optim a optimal tra uh, treasury, uh, treasury after the trauma. Let's we just show that majority of people will not live into the trauma, but a lot of people who get into traumatic events and then develop the PTSD symptoms will recover much quicker. So that's what we call the resilience. Think about, yeah, a bamboo, and if you bend it, bend over it, and then if you release and it will back to the place, that's what resilience for. So if we put vulnerability into a re resilience category, we can see they have a lower, relatively low resilience rather than vulnerability. So I think it's this shift may play a role even when we talk to our patient. Talk to our patient to tell them, I, I borrow a lot of slogans from other places. Like if I talk to my patient, want them to work more, I would tell, yeah, you can do it, I can help. That's from Home Depot, right? And also I, <laughs> and for this word, I would say that uh, you are stronger than you think. That's from Scotia Bank. That you're richer than you think. So, so yeah, but that's true. That's what, what I'm trying to tell the patient and to remind them that uh, they are still here. They're still in my office. They're not end up some, somewhere else. It's because they have some ability there and then we have to discover that and amplify that and use that as a tool, not only for this moment, but for the future. Okay, so this is a very model of resilience showing that resilience is a very broad, a broad character that can, we can include the post-traumatic growth, which, which shows that how we can back to the, the, the stream that we are going to do, we back to the, to the, to the normal, uh, the normal, the, the, the healthy pathways, and also the the vulnerability part, the stress vulnerability. So, why we put together this way is because resilience is a term that we think that we can work on, we can help, we can change, and the vulnerability or stress, and it's something that uh, we put things that is a stat 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 is a status quo, and or it's a past thing. So by putting vulnerability under the resilience, it helps us to see the vulnerability or the risk factors as a, as a, a point that we can work on. And rather than just leave it there, say there's nothing I can do with it. So the features of resilience is like, so it's not, it's not, uh, so it can only show up when we uh, experience uh, difficulties. Because we're all sitting here nicely and relaxed, it won't show our resilience, only if we're facing the issues. Second is, uh, it's a conscious and insightful effort to move forward. So it's not like naturally something that's happened and, and the patient is not aware of. So that's why for, for, for therapists, and we have to really put them into a conscious level and uh, and also to, 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 to explore and, and to inspire the patient if they're not to the conscious level yet. So say, third one is that it's a positive manner to join the personal, social, culture, and environmental resource all together and to use those power, use this support to, to leaders to recover faster. So let's also point out we not only we cannot only work along there with our client by ourselves. We have to incorporate all the possible source and resources to make this healing process faster. So, okay, so I think I'm really behind. So, okay, <clears throat> and the it's a dynamic character. So we it's not the one time, and it's a, it keeps shaping our life and keep making us who we are and. Uh, who will be for the future. Okay. And, and also this very insightful part is, it's, 
if we can learn from the adverse experience and then we can move on to use this resource experience, that will be the best way to, 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 to recover. That's what uh, things doesn't kill you, make you stronger, right? I think it's from a song. So that's how I learn my English from piece by piece. Okay, <laughs> all right. So I will quickly go through this. So the childhood and adulthood, <clears throat> and adulthood, we have different characters that you can see and you can, you can, you can relate them to resilience. And if anyone wants to know that, and I can send this uh, one to, to you. So second, how do we diagnose PTSD? It depends on where we stay, what kind of system we're using. And uh, in Canada and the States, we're using DSM-5. And in the rest of the world, they use ICD-11. This is like our imperial and, and the, how we measure meter of fit. So, and I wish I could use ICD-10 because look at this is ICD-10. It's like very simple. And this is DSM-5. <laughs> so, but unfortunately, my, my Royal College exam used DSM-5. So, and uh, yeah, so what's the difference? DSM-5 incorporated a lot of uh, symptoms that uh, overlap with other mental health conditions like anxiety, depression. And uh, ICD-10, or ICD-11, try to eliminate that and make the uh, makes the uh, PTSD more accurate and uh, standing alone by itself. So by that differences, it's actually that when, when the same population are diagnosed or using a different diagnosis system and the prevalence changed from 10 to 30 percent. That means DSM-5 have almost 10 to 30 percent higher PTSD diagnosis compared to ICD-11. So, that will definitely change and mess up our future research because you, paper published in Europe or other places will be, we're talking about two, two different populations compared to people that we studied here in Canada and the States. So I don't know how much tr cross the knowledge can be translated Across the across the globe and different in the different population, so that's something we need to to really pay attention to when we read the literature. So, DSM five and put this, this long, so it's it's actually several pages. So I just put them this way. So first is exposed to the life threatening traumatic events, then persistent re experiencing. Remember the 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 one we call the trauma. So I'm not going to to go too much about it, but only point one is a section D, the negative change of self, future, and the world, which is not in the ICD-11. Why is that? It's because this is a, this is a back triangle and talk about depression, and when we do a CBD, CBT treatment is how our negative perspective to ourself, to, to our future, and to the world change how we react and our, where our emotions are. So that's a, that's a CBD, uh, CBD con concept, but it's not specific to PTSD. So it has to be one month, causing significant trouble and, dis and, and uh, if the onset, if the first symptoms start six months later, we call them delayed onset. And also if patient present with a dissociation dissociated symptoms, it's a subcategory, which re represented another category, another term that we do not use in DSM-5 called complex PTSD. It's only occur, only showed in the, it's only showed in the ICD-11. So, and I think uh, Paul will talk about the dissociation, uh, dissociation and the treatment later. So that's why I want to bring them up. So this one is super easy for us to, capture the DSM-5, see how we do it. So first, do we have trauma events? If no, it's no PTSD. So if, it's, if it is, and is directly endangered, witnessed, or it's, 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 work, it's work related. If it's no, there's no PTSD. So it, any causing any meets the criteria, as we say, 
one intrusive, one avoidance, two cognitive mood changes, and two arousal. If not, no PTSD. And then more than one month? If yes, yeah. So this is a little bit black and white, even that we're not necessarily put all our patients into, yes, you, you have PTSD, you need treatment, no PTSD, no treatment, because different patients have different tolerance, and, uh, and, uh, but this definitely gives us a, 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 cap, a, a picture of what is PTSD and how we diagnose it. So again, we talked about the, oh, this part is uh, repeated. Okay, so I will just skip that. So now we go to the fun part, Bi neurobiology. So I'm going to talk to myself. You, you, <laughs> you are allowed to take take a break from here. All right. So, so this is what I'm going to talk about. This first is the model. So what what's the general thinking about PTSD? What happened is. Uh, genetic and environment interactions. And then second is, how does the trauma and the stress affect our, our brain? And how the early life trauma changes the picture? And then what the sex and gender play the role here? And then the, how does eventually trauma influence the, the whole picture as a disorder? Okay. So first is, PTSD is very typical disorder. We, we use this model called the gene and the environmental model, which is uh, uh, interactions between them. So we have a vulnerability there. And on top of that, the environment, the stress, and change, change the pathway of how we're dealing, how we're going. That probably means if we have the vulnerability, but we never really going through that, we won't get the issue. But, uh, but not everybody going through the trauma will have PTSD because the vulnerability or the, the genetic component is there and to do the rest of the work. So here it's very interesting to see the first part is uh, early trauma plays a very important role. On top of the genetic, this is uh, several gen genes that have been identified uh, associated with, uh, with, uh, with uh, PTSD, which are born like that. So people carry that even before they experience any trauma. And, but with, with this vulnerability, and early trauma or repeated trauma can change the epigenetic part. What is epigenetic? Epigenetic is the gene is the same, the DNA is the same, but when we transcript the DNA into a protein, and the DNA, the, the, there's some part of the DNA got modified and become much easier to to, to be shut it down or to be amplified and much easier to translate those proteins. That means the gene part is not changed, but the way how gene expressed and uh, has changed. That's how the early trauma can really play a lot of role. And later I will show you a picture, see how many areas that are gonna affect it. So that may, may or may not directly cause PTSD, but Later on, when we have adult side, adulthood, we have another trauma, and we can really trigger, trigger the vulnerability and leading our patient be more likely to have a PTSD symptoms. So that's leading us to see the change. The, it changed the brain structure, and it changed the inflammation status, and also the fear inhibition. And that's leading us to see whether we will have a PTSD, or will be more resilience. So this, this, this uh, uh, gene and environmental model looks quite familiar, or could quite similar like what we think about cancer. In cancer, you probably heard about called the second strike model. That means it's already vulnerable, and the second, then the, with the environment or with other, other impact factors causing the, the cancer. So this is similar concept here. So, PTSD is pretty much is a, is a decompensation. It's a decompensate stage from our, our, our 
the regulation system. We're all going through trauma. We're all going through the stage similar like PTSD. We are frightened and we remember the trauma. We try to not think about that. But eventually, we move on. We start to leave, that, leave the traumatic events as events, as a, as a fact. And we, we strip of, off the emotional part of the trauma. And uh, then, so then we can live on and we can move on. So, but PTSD is more like this. So most people will bounce around and then coming back. But PTSD seems bounced out of the range that we are able to handle. So the stuck on and the stuck off. So that's the two sides. So stuck on showing a lot of things about our hypervigilant, the anxiety. And stuck off part represents a lot of like numbness and depression, the avoidance. This type of like, a, one is hot, one is cold, if we think about it this way. So that's how the bounce on the both sides and to represent the symptoms. So when we talk about trauma or the PTSD, we have to talk about this very, very interesting part or very boring part, quote. So it's our brain. So our brain divided into so many different areas and it plays a different role. We, we not fully understand what exactly they're doing, but at least there are several parts we have to remember. If there's an exam, first is the amygdala. Amygdala and the hippocampus, that's a main component of what we call the limbic, limbic system. So limbic system developed way earlier than our, our, our cortex. So this, this stem, and the cerebellum part, uh, the early stage development. And then we developed this second part, the limbic and the subcortical area, eventually, and this one. From a personal development, from, uh, like from, um, from a fetus development, also from the evolutional development, the same. Because this part leads us to survive. We have to have breath, heart rate, and the sleep and cycles, everything controlled by the, the brainstem. And later on, we have this limbic system to engage with the environment, is fight or flight. So we have to survive in the, in the very harsh environment, not Earth, but uh, our ancestors, the uh, dinosaurs and uh, dragonflies. So, yeah, so then, so they, they they don't need, we do not need to think about should I move, should I hide, and when we're facing a, a tiger attacking us. So we just do it. So that's what they do. They help us to survive. And the bigger, the, the cortex part actually developed the, the higher in terms of the intelligence, the higher of the development, the, evo the evolution, and we have higher and much bigger cortex. That helps us to understand the world, to change the world and to, to, to make a judgment of our decisions. So the prefrontal cortex part is very important for our executive function. How we make things, how we make, make decisions, how we make uh, to choose things and to decide what to do. So when we have a stress or a environment or very traumatic events, and what happened first is when we see that and the signal, the sound, everything, we will immediately pass to our, to our uh, amygdala. So amygdala will be activated and sending a message to hippocampus to say, no, let's coordinate this, let's, let's run. So meanwhile, they will activate the pituitary part and leading to, to prepare the body to be able to run. That's what we do is that first is we put the, we change the sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, uh, nervous system. And then second is we, we release a lot of cortisol. So in that case, we can prepare ourselves. And meanwhile, this, this limbic system also send a message to prefrontal cortex said, shut up, I'm running, don't judge me. Because <clears throat> otherwise, no, you, you, should, you should be brave. You should uh, face the situation. No, I'm not. I'm going. So that's, a, that's one of the main reasons to, to keep us survive. And uh, so that, that's legit. So 
But after, but the, the issue for PTSD is this stage continues when we're not in the environment, when the, the, the prefrontal cortex permanently, not permanently, like lost their control, lost their, uh, for, for much longer time. So the, then we, 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 our judgment system down to every day I have to run, fight, uh, run off, flight or fight. So as we mentioned, there's a, the, the stress system, one is, one goes to here, is called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. We probably all know that. And the, the sympathetic ones, Drived by by norepinephrine, dopamine, and uh, and norepinephrine, and so that leading us to have increased heart rate, and increased uh, breath, and we shrink the muscles in our organs, and but pump the muscles, sorry, shrink the vessels in the in in our organs, but pump up the muscle muscle part, so then we can fight or 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 fly, so and. Meanwhile, we have this one that's leading to here, we call it HP access, and we have, a, a, this is adrenaline part, we have a rush of adrenaline, and that pump up the glucose, glucose and from our liver and to supply the, the need for the muscle to run. So that's worked very well in the moment. However, if the HP access are constantly activated, and that will lead into uh, a lot of cortisol released, even without the actual stre stress. Or then this combat will inhibit the thalamus and the the whole access. But meanwhile, it will have very uh, detrimental impact on our hippocampus and amygdala. Cortisol are uh, neurotoxic, if we, if we see that way. And uh, if we expose, our brain expose them for a prolonged time, it will kill the brain cells, and then it leading to atrophy in a lot of brain areas, like hippocampus. So, so HP, HP access played a very important role in mental health conditions like in depression and in PTSD. But why PTSD, depression, the antidepressant and the treatment is the first line versus PTSD not? And partially, partially because of the HPA access as well. So one is, the difference is, we, when we see the, the constant level, the increased level of HPA, and the cortisol levels are the paradox is low in PTSD. It's supposed to be high, but it's low. So one, the reason is, as we mentioned, PTSD is very genetic, have a lot of genetic component. And in the patient with PTSD, at least in this, those research, uh, research published, uh, like a patient involved, and they, they actually have a very sensitive uh, receptors for the cortisol levels. So in that case, we do not need such a, a big amount of uh, such a big amount of cortisol to to pump up and to cause the trouble. Even very tiny change will lead into a very sensitive uh, receptor that amplifies them much higher than the depression. So that this is this is the same thing. See the impact. From the lower, if we see the, the narrow, it's much narrow cortisol on our HP system and will cause a similar trouble, but we use a very low end of the, sorry, okay, now I think I'm too quick, all right. So this is a acute stress and on our, our parasympathetic system. So as we mentioned, it bounced back and back to the normal that we have a relaxed stage. Well, here, if we have a chronic one, and we will never come back, and so our sympathetic part will, much be, will be much higher in general. That's why we do box breathing and other relaxing activities to active our diaphragm and to change, to, to reverse the system. Okay, 
PTSD is just like this. It's all over the place. And the wind's high, it's caused anxiety, insomnia, impulsivity. When the low part causes a flat, flat effort, depression, and so on. So, yeah, so I will skip the genetic part because uh, it's uh, not necessarily immediately will help us anyway. But uh, all the genetic studies showing that uh, it's linked to two interesting parts. One is the cortisol metabolism. That explains why the cortisol level uh, changes are different. And second is to, and this is a very interesting one, is uh, shared with schizophrenia, especially for the re-experience. Why is that is because there's a theory showing that re-experience, reliving, and kind of like a, 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 a hallucination. So that's, uh, that's why from genetic perspective they support this is why that's a, it's not there, but it's so vivid and it is so convincing. So this is the childhood trauma, as we say, multiple time uh, change of the stress will leading us to have a, a chronic stress and the chronic stress causing the change of our brain structure the atrophy of hippocampus and the, also the decreased the function and decreased the uh, structure for the, hip, for the prefrontal cortex. Okay, and the study that will show that epigenetics, that's how stress can change our early life, change the person, uh, change all the different, uh, different proteins chain and in, in terms of uh, uh, their expressions in the early childhood, adulthood as well. When, when, mo when mom, when pregnant, when pregnant women going through this, it also changes a lot of their structures, and that actually can be passed along to the, to the next generation. And partially, this is explanation, biological explanation of generation trauma. Okay, sex and gender. So we can see that uh, it's definitely a very complex, uh, complex the, from psychological to social the hormone levels and the, the receptor activities are all different. All right, so I'll be quickly going through this. So this is very interesting to see. This, this one showed what's the difference between a complex PTSD and uh, borderline. You can see a lot of overlap there, but uh, we can see some self, the self-harm, the unstable relationship, the impulsivity are not are not seen in complex PTSD, but the guilt, but the interpersonal detached affect dysregulation and the self-worthiness are all the similar. So when we, when we talk about PTSD and the borderline, we'd better to think about it. And then this is showed how much 80% of people who has PTSD has another mental health conditions. We need to screen them very carefully and make sure that we covered everything. Cardiovascular disorder, cancer, diabetes, that all go up, and not one time, but multiple times in patients with PTSD because they share the same system in terms of the, the, the stress related. So yeah, so 20% of patients may improve with the treatment, and that's, what we're doing so far. That's best we're doing. So it's obviously not enough. So, so when, you, when we see a patient with a trauma, what do we do? So this NICE guideline, NICE is an England guideline showing that if this patient does not have any traumatic experience vocalized, do not bother to have a debriefing. Do not bother to talk to the patient and about the trauma, it might cause more harm than than, than good. If they have mild mild symptoms but not too severe, in in the four, in the first of four weeks, watch and see. We do not engage in that too actively. It, it may cause more harm than 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 good. So, ch child and adolescent directly ask the trauma, ask experience from them, not necessarily always from their caregivers, because uh, everybody have a different concept, everybody have a different, different uh, way to interpret the trauma. Okay. And education. 
we educate them that uh, there's a possibility of PTSD and how the patient can, what patient can do, what patient can watch for. So, and screen. This is a really interesting part and also very important. Then I just want you to remember the, 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 the place, uh, the, the tools. So there's a two type of tools. One is 20 items, and that's all developed by the Department, the De Department of Defense, I think. Of veterans of defense, yeah. So then they have different uh, uh, for civ for civilians for 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 military person. So if you do not familiar with diagnosis, you can use this one. The patient can screen can can fill out, and then you can you can you can have a really good uh, picture of it. If you have a very busy practice, like a family doctor or other practice, this primary care one that only have five five score. And also can give you a very good picture of whether you should engage with patient, talk about trauma or treat trauma. So I will skip here. I'm glad I skipped here, the intervention part, because that really makes us so incompetent. There's nothing really, most of us know. And there's only one or two say, yeah, yes, OK. All right, I will stop here. And any, should we start questions? When a bowl is broken in Japan, it's put back together with the cracks being filled with gold, creating a beautiful lining. This is to emphasize the beauty in what was once broken. They believe that when something has suffered damage and has a history, it makes it more beautiful. And the same goes for human beings. Everything that you've been through, everything that you're going through, doesn't make your life uglier, although it may seem that way when we're going through it. It's up to us to choose to paint our struggles with gold and make it beautiful. You are not broken beyond repair. You can pick yourself up and learn from what's happened and become a better person from it because of the struggle that you've been through. You can wear your scars proudly as a badge of honor, as if to say, look at what I've been through. It's made me who I am today, and I can get through anything life puts in front of me now. Okay, so that's, I just want to share this one with uh, everybody, and uh, I think this is the attitude we have to have first. Then we can pass it along to our patient. Not necessarily the first day, because that's gonna be really condescending, but, but the attitude and the way that's how we embed this hope and the resilience should be part of, at least for me, is part of our practice day to day. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Any questions? Did I strike down everybody with the bi bi biology? It's <laughs> good. Um, thanks very much for that. It's very engaging, but very condensed. And I'm just wondering if there's not a lot of questions, if you could go back and just talk a little bit more about that uh, multi-generational slide, the Kaplan one on epigenetic transmission of early life, st life stress. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so think about this way. So I would <clears throat> we always think about gen genes are the only materials that are heritable and pass along the information and to the next generation. But this concept has changed since we discovered epigenetic change. So epigenetic change is not on the, uh, the DNA level. When you think about DNA, the DNA is like, uh, what, I even forgot this is four letters, A, uh, whatever, AC. So it's, it's not only those all together. The DNA uh, are way more complicated than that. DNA are not standing alone there. DNA actually wrapped them around a protein called histone protein. So the, how fa <clears throat> it's like if, if we have a, a, like a, a, a roll at home, it depends how, you, how tightly you can wrap it and it, it changes the structure, right? So the, 
And if we write them really tightly, and all the strings will, will, will get together so, so, in, so in, intense. And the, there's, one, there's some certain proteins, it's called transcriptor factors, will be difficult to engage, to, to, to put them on, and then start to make, make the mRNA to translate the protein. So what do we, we when we have to, to generate some protein, this part has to be loosened up and to get, have the gap so that so so that can that machine can 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 hook it up and then start to to work to generate so but that come from the interactions between the protein and the uh, interaction from the dna and the protein they wrapped it up so many of the tiny part of the protein uh, can be modified by either we can put a uh, math, like a like a like the methified, or it's like we put a, a small, uh, I would say the small part. Then in that case, it thinks that you just put something in the gap and then open the crack. So the more you put them there, the, the, the it will change. It will change the the gap and to make them easier or more difficult to to be translated into a protein. So that is not controlled by it's controlled by both the, the natural process. Uh, we need it, so we start to, to change it. But the stress actually can change this process and uh, involuntarily make it open. So that will generate more, more uh, proteins than we, we want, and then to change the function. So this actually will, will occur when we have, when, when the person who when the person who has the trauma, and uh, like in, in early adult, in early life, and also in adulthood, but how do we translate or pass along the stress and to the next generations? So first is let's see it's here the motherhood. When 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 mom was pregnant, the stress will come from both sides. The mom will going through all the. All the, all, the, all the stress, and the, the change will be there, and the hormone change, especially the cortisol change and, and, and norepinephrine change, will pass the placenta to the, to the, to the kid. So the kid, like say, sitting there, receiving the similar chemical impact as the mom who going through the going through the stress. So then they start to change this, and that's nothing to do with the gene that passed along, but, but it changes the process of how the gene function and to, to make the proteins that work for, for, for the life. So that's one way. And second is, so when this one changed and it will carry it on, when the, when the, when the baby that's still in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the womb and, and changed, it will carry along from their life. So that's how it starts to impact on the, on the next, uh, next generation. And this generation who were born, and when they're facing challenge, when they're facing the, the stress, remember the early life stress. And then we can pass the early life stress even further to the fatal stress. So that means the stress in their early life become a repeated and not the first time they experience, but probably the second or third time. If we count the mom's, mom's stress, mom's, uh, the, the passing along, um, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, 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 the trauma or the stress that mom has. So that's one part of, of this. And second is the histone, the, let's say the epigenetic changes and will come back to modify some part of the, the genetic, the genes, and to modify the one that's modulating the, the, the epigenetic changes. So that become a, a print and to gradually change the DNA part. So, but that leading to several generations to, to stabilize that gene, that, that change. Because most time when we have a genetic muta uh, mutation, we either survive or we've been wiped out. But this change is not that significant. It will carry it along with us. So that's how, from, from very uh, simple, simplistic way to explain it. So yeah.